find a copy of the Holy Text. You do not have that. There's one provided for you in the pew pocket. And go with me to Acts 25. Now you will find, uh, as you look in your worship guide, and I would like everyone, especially the men, to hold up their worship guide. Uh, come on, men, I'm waiting on you. Find one. If you don't, I'm going to wait till everybody's got one. Come on, men, hold them up, hold them up, hold them up, hold them up. Okay, that's what you take notes on. Look there, find that sermon section. Got a very common title, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Is there anybody in here <laughs> that has never been in that place? Paul was in that place. And as you realize, we are coming to the last message in our study in the book of Acts. It is a lengthy passage. I don't know how long it would take me to read 25 through 28 to you, but it would take way too much time. So I want to read what I want to call the focus passage and then kind of give a storyline and then move into the message. So go to... Acts 25, and find verse 10. Acts 25 and verse 10. Paul is before Festus. Festus is trying to please the Jews. The Jews are plotting to kill Paul. And we come to this text. I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. That's pretty bold. I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar between a rock and a hard place. When relationships and reasonableness come together, do you have the resolve to stand for Christ? Even if it would cost you your life. Pray with me. Father, today I thank you for your word the fact that it is powerful. And Lord, we mean by that word that it not only can be sensed and known, but it changes us. When we are influenced by it, we can no longer be the same. And I pray today, Father, that as we consider those difficult moments in our life when we needed to lean on the everlasting arms. Father, when we look at what made that strength possible through Calvary and the blood that our Lord shed there and how the result of that brought, Father, to us that which we could sense and feel like the wind and be showered over like the rain and be enlivened with as fire that, Father, we would come to the resolve that the Apostle Paul did, and that is the perfect will of God in his life. Lord, help us to make the appeal that puts us in the place you designed, no matter what the cost. I pray that in Jesus' blessed and holy name. Amen. My New Testament professor, when I first entered college said that as a young man, he had a sense of being mischievous. 
I know y'all probably wouldn't believe that your pastor was also that way. I, I know that, you know, when I would go to camp, I would always make a run by the store and get the itching powder. I always had a bottle of shaving cream and a feather. And I went to camp to have some fun. <laughs> And if it was the toilet paper battles that we had in the bunk room for which we got excluded after that year, I was a part of that. <laughs> uh, I have some of that in me, so it really made it interesting to me for him to say that he was mischievous because I thought, well, you know, maybe we got some identity here. And, and he said, you know, I always wondered what it would be like if you took two cats tied them together by their tail, and dropped them over a clothesline. So, he took two cats, <laughs> tied them by the tail, and dropped them over his mother's clothesline. This sounds like a spiritual message, right? And if you don't think that that's not true... If you ever find yourself between those two cats, you know what it's like to be between a rock and a hard place. Blood and fur flying, and he was just amazed at that. And it's wonderful for everyone except the person who's in between it, right? Well, I thought I would bring you up to par on your information of the day. How many of y'all recognize this? Can you see it well enough to recognize that? That's Phil Robertson. How many of you know about Duck Dynasty? <laughs> what do you do when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place? Well, some of us do one thing, but this is what he did when a leading cable network decided to suspend the patriarch of America's, and if you want to make fun of rednecks, just realize they are rich rednecks. <laughs> America's top-rated cable program, the resulting firestorm exposed a clear divide on the moral landscape of our country. Franklin Graham goes on to say, the evangelical church today has grown all too accepting of sin. The church, I love it, is ducking. <laughs> the church is ducking the vital moral issues of our age rather than influencing our culture by being gospel salt and light. The church has itself become influenced by the permissive culture in which we live. What a true statement. And folks, like it or not, the church in America is between a rock and a hard place. So this morning, we go to another person who, in his religious pilgrimage, found himself between a rock and a hard place. He's being tried by Festus, who was immoral and a degenerate. He's been removed from office, and now after two years in prison, Paul has been turned over, never having been proven guilty of anything, to Festus, who is a much better man and truly desired to do what was right. And then alongside Festus comes a man with some Jewish persuasion, understanding Jewish culture, thus the charges that a Roman would not understand, and Paul ends up also before King Agrippa. Now, it takes a good bit of most of this reading between 25 and 28 to get all of that information. Now, the focal point is the fact that in the midst of this, Paul appeals as a Roman citizen, which was his right, to Caesar. For you see, not even Festus, the governor, or the procurator, whatever you want to call him, not even Festus, who stood for Rome, had the right to send a Roman citizen 
to be tried without his permission. He always had the right to make an appeal to Caesar. Now, if you don't notice this, even though it has changed quite a bit, our entire legal system rests upon the dynamics of this very culture. Birthed in the city-states of the Hellenistic age of Greeks, brought over and adopted by the Romans, and eventually laying the foundation of democracy in the Western culture. So Paul appeals to Rome. He goes through a trial that takes him on a travel journey. You've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. That is what Festus said. And it took him months to get from there to where he was headed. In fact, he warned the captain of the boat, don't go. Have you ever had a warning from God? Don't do that. And because you chose to do it, it puts you between a rock and a hard place. Well, yeah, hey, that wasn't just a part of the sermon. That was a real question. <laughs> have you? Have you made a decision? I know I've made many where I knew when I made it, I was doing what Greg wanted to do instead of what God wanted me to do, and I found myself between a rock and a hard place as a result of it. Except this time, Paul was doing exactly what God wanted him to do, but he couldn't influence the folks who were taking him there, and as a result, 276 of them ended up in a crash on a sandbar. Now that can be scary when I was dating my wife it was right after one of our major hurricanes and I wanted to really you know influence her in a right direction for our relationship so I was going to take her by boat to go eat at a restaurant and we drove over to what used to be Hamilton's, not Hamilton's, uh, Arbor House, over in St. Andrew. We docked the boat, went in and ate, and we were having a good time. Do y'all remember dating when it was fun? And you just talked, and it just didn't seem like you could get in enough conversation, and you sometimes don't pay attention like you should, and I let it get dark. Not only did I let it get dark, I let it get dark on a night when it was very cloudy and there was thunder and lightning. Have you ever been on the water at night in a boat without lights? It is disorienting. But I followed the course that was true. At least it was true before the hurricane. <laughs> Only to find a sandbar. Ooh! Now my soon-to-be bride is distressed. What are we going to do? I said, well, I'm going to have to get out and push it off the sand. You can't get out of this boat. I said, you want to sit here all night? <laughs> you know? Well, I, I can't tell you I was exactly excited. I've caught a lot of things out of those waters, and I know what comes up in those waters late at night. And two nice lily white legs under just enough light from the boat. You, you know what I'm talking about, so I had to push the boat off. But we were saved, and just like Paul said, they were saved. And uh, some of them came in on planks of the boat that was being torn up from the stern. Some of them swam ashore. And uh, I'm telling you what, the waters were cold. They built a fire, and while they were building the fire, <laughs> Paul got snake bit. How's your journey? Ever happened like that to you? Well, it was amazing. As the folks who lived there in Malta saw the bite, <laughs> it wasn't just any bite. It was the bite of a snake that killed you dead quick. And they were amazed 
It had no effect on him at all. Now, there's a little section in Mark's gospel. Have y'all read that? About snakes and poison? I, I, did, I want to clarify something for you. If you get upset with me about your understanding of God's Word, in the oldest manuscripts, that piece isn't in there. Nobody's going to say amen. <laughs> I am not going to get into handling snakes and drinking poison. I can just tell you. Uh, but he got bit and he should have died. But he didn't. God miraculously spared Paul. They wanted to worship him as a result of it. But Paul moves on. They find another port, another way of transporting himself. They have to winter. That means they stay through the stormy months. And finally, three months later, he makes his way to Rome. Now, it wasn't that easier than reading chapters 25 through 28. I want to encourage you to go back and do that, but now I want you to look at some of the specifics in this text that will help us when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place. First, we need to understand when we are in a position of such the relationships around us. It's very important that you look up and pay attention to what's going on around you. Paul understood the relationships. He knew about Festus and his appointment. He knew that when Festus was appointed, that the very first thing that would happen, because he was over an area that was primarily Jewish, that the Jewish leaders of the political parties would do their best to influence him. Has anybody ever hated you bad enough to carry a grudge for two years? I mean, they're sitting perched for two years still waiting to kill Paul. God has already, by his hand, wiped out several of those who pursued in an ungodly direction a man of God, and yet they're still ready to perch on Paul and have him killed. And Paul knew this. It was important. For him to know that. Friend, it is important for you to know and for me to know our enemy. Satan is a murderer, John says, and he lives ever roaming to and fro upon the earth looking from, for whom he may devour. That means to rip and tear apart. I'll tell you what, if you belong to the Lord, you can count on one thing. You need to know this. Your relationship with the devil will always be adversarial. He is always out to get you. If you don't know where he is and what he's doing, you better be looking over your shoulder. You know, there are periods in my ministry where it just seems like things get calm and peace. I, I mean, I get anxious. I I'd rather know where he is and what he's doing. But he is definitely there. And whether it be in a Roman government or in a Jewish antagonistic society, Paul understood the appointment. And he understood what would happen. And in fact, the text tells us that as soon as he takes the appointment, he goes to Jerusalem and immediately the Jewish leaders begin to try to influence him. In fact, they want him to bring Paul to the Roman court in Jerusalem, which was fine to do, in order that they might en route kill him. Now, they've already lost one battle because they got Paul rerouted. Do you remember from last sermon that we had in Acts where a whole host of an army by night, took Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and now the Jews want, with their knowledge of the trip, for Paul to be brought back from Caesarea to Jerusalem, and their intention is to kill him. He knew about the appointment. He knew about the appearance, the false appearance of the appointment. That is, he knew his accusers. They had not let up on the three things for which they accused him. 
They accused him of breaking Moses' law. They accused him of desecrating the temple. They accused him of being an insurrectionist against the Roman government. None of the three of which they could prove. But he knew that his accusers would accuse him of the same thing. But he knew something else in this appearance. He knew that even though Festus was a good man desiring to do right, he was a lost man and a Roman who wanted to look good to Caesar. And he knew they wouldn't take one moment to think about exploiting Paul and his situation. And friend, if you don't think that as a believer the world won't seek to exploit you, you're fooling yourself. Not only is the evil one out there accusing you, calling you a hypocrite, making fun and sport of you, but they are ever ready to exploit you. It was very important that Paul, it's very important that you and I understand our relationship. And then there is the appeasement in verse 9 that is the part of the heart of this man to influence the people he's come to serve and rule over. And Paul knew that. And finally, Paul knew his own rights. He knew that as a Roman citizen, He could not be taken to another court without his permission. And so while all of this is unfolding, he waits for that moment. And he says, if there's something I've done that's deserving of death, then I'm willing to die. But until that occurs, I appeal to Caesar. Festus reached up, wiped the sweat from his brow and says, Good! To Caesar you will go. Have you ever been so happy to get something off your hands because somebody else (laughs) uh, made a strategic move? You need to know your relationships. Because when it gets down to being between a rock and a hard place, those understandings can either save you or destroy you. So Paul when between a rock and a hard place, knew his relationships. He also knew the reasons that relationships were important. First, he knew that the Jews intended to kill him. Second, he knew that that would not happen if he would keep his faith in God. Because though they desired death for him, God had a different destination. And so in chapter 28 and 14, isn't it interesting that when we know the reason for life, it quite often directs our destiny. Notice what it says. And so we came to Rome. And so we came to Rome. A person who is caught between a rock and a hard place in the midst of understanding appointments and appearances and appeasements and appeals needs to know that the risk is worth taking when God is in control. For God will not allow one thing to happen to you that he doesn't sanction. Now that doesn't mean that he is intentional but he can be permissive. But he always accomplishes his act. I am convinced, Paul said, that he is able to complete what he started. I wonder this morning in the midst of your difficulties, maybe in the midst of the difficulties of someone that you need to give a word to, you could say to them with a certainty, God is able Know your relationships. Know the risk that's involved in being a Christian. It is a cross-bearing experience and journey. But know that nothing can dissuade God's purpose for your life. Not even the courts of the land. 
not even misinformed boat captains, not even snake bites. Which brings us to the end. Understanding his relationships and knowing the reasons those interactions of the relationships took place, Paul has resolve. 27, verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them. And said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. Kind of a bold thing to say (laughs) when being tossed overboard wouldn't mean a whole lot to some of them. But now I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, beside me, and he came beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Well, do you have that kind of resolve? Resolve like that? And I want you to notice, it's in three words in the end of the text that we read. Keep up your courage. If you're going to have resolve to overcome being in that spot between a rock and a hard place, you're going to have to have fortitude. You're going to have to have courage. Keep your courage. In the book of Joshua, we just got through studying it. The repetitive verse is, be strong and of good courage. It's not just strength, it's believing that God will do what he said he will do. He not only had fortitude in his resolve, but he also had faith. He believed and trusted. God, who had taken care of him through multiple beatings that should have killed him, through a time of being stoned from one escape to another. In fact, it started with Paul at the get-go when they had to get him out of town by letting him over a wall in a basket. But what did Paul's history with his God teach him? It taught him what your history and mine should teach me is that God is faithful. He can be trusted. So take courage. I have faith that God will do exactly what he said he would do. You can't say that and hear it with confidence if it's not meant. Friend, you're going to find yourself sometimes between a rock and a hard place and there is no seeming way out. And all you have is being courageous in God being certain that God will do what he says. And guess what that does? That determines your future. Fortitude, faith, and future. Paul had resolve. The resolve took Paul from the hands of the government and the hands of the religious leaders and from the hands of a stormy sea, and from the hands of a snake bite, and it sent him where? Exactly where God said he would testify for him. It sent him to Rome. Three things, and we close. Very important when you're dealing with being in that place, that place between a rock and a hard place. Listen to me, church. One, don't be leveraged. Don't be leveraged. In all difficult moments where there's seemingly a lack of power, 
Someone is going to play the power game. Don't be leveraged. Do exactly what God says to do the way God says to do it. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? If you have aught with a brother or a sister in Christ, go to them alone and do your dead level best to work it out just between the two of you. What a difference it would make in our churches, in our relationships, if we would seek to do that first before we involved other opinions and outsiders. Do what God says the way God says to do it. And if that doesn't work, then when you choose the witness, be sure it is someone who desires the very thing that the heart of God desires when there's broken relationships between people. And if that doesn't work, let it rest in the hands of the church. I promise you, if we would do that, it would change not only us, but the dynamic of our fellowship. Don't be leveraged when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place. The next thing, Enjoy the journey. Oh, my goodness. If you just knew how bad my place is between the rock and the hard place. I can't do this. I won't make it. No, you back up. Rest on God. Stand when you don't think you can stand anymore. And, friend, enjoy the journey. But you can't do that if you don't know that God is sure and certain to finish what he started. Finally, rest in the truth. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of any man what God has prepared for them that love him. Erase the bad theology and eschatology that you've been taught and understand that that verse is in the present. Not in the future. That is not pie in the sky by and by. That is the reality for every believer who will put their faith and trust in God. And I'll promise you, when you get to that point, you will be able to stand when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place. And who knows, church? Maybe we'll rise up and begin a firestorm that affects our culture with the salt and the light of the gospel. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. And as they come, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in prayer.